Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. We talked, we mentioned it a little bit, but like last week we started talking, it, it you know, just popped into my head because of that breakfast that I did last week. And last week we started talking about, you know, some of the prominent female entrepreneurs and it wasn't really just entrepreneurs, right? It was like founders, ecosystem participants and, you know, company builders and ecosystem builders as well in Southeast Asia. And in the middle of recording, I mean, I guess I should really say in the middle of doing the research and the prep for last week, it just occurred to me that one episode or one hour just wasn't enough time. Not enough, right? No way to discuss all the important women in this in this category, right? In this in this thing. Like I think I even said to you, if I go back and listen to the taping yeah. of this, that uh we've got to do another episode of this. Exactly. So there's plenty welcome. more people we can get on, right? Yeah, I mean it's not even close. And we'll see even at the end of this and you know, it's not enough, but we need to go on to other topics. But I wanted to do more just so people got a sense for the fact that you could just go on and on on this topic and it would never end. So it's kind of like welcome to female and entrepreneurs in Asia part two, basically. But I'll tell you what, one of the most interesting things to me was that in the week following last week's podcast, mm -hmm. people came to me and it wasn't just women, men and women came to me, contacted me somehow, whether it was an email over chat or just in person and said, hey, how come you didn't mention right. basically just fill in your favorite female founder? <laughs> With so many people, right. and, and it got to the point where I was like, "Okay, okay, I get it, I get it, I'll right. do more." Yeah, well, we don't have time. I mean, you know, there must be hundreds, no. right? Well, that's the thing. And when we start talking about one of the other ladies, Roshni Matani, at the end, you'll see that she's built a group around female founders in Asia that has over two thousand people in it. Wow! Right. So now all of them are not going to be the A team, but I mean, even if half of them are amazing, that's a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? So in that context, um, and again, this is just something that happened to me over the weekend. I was meeting with another founder of a different company. He brought one of his partners in one of his businesses, and you know, I, I met this woman named Vicky Chen. And to be fair, I'd heard about Vicky in the past, but I had never met her before. And you know, she was just another one of these amazing ladies who toils away without anybody knowing about it except the people that interact with her and her companies and and some of them are pretty amazing but this is kind of like the beginning of last week's episode where we just touched on one person and it kind of led into a few other people so i just want to talk about vicky for a second yeah let's do it vicky when, when she was literally like 21 or 20 years 22 years old conceived started and, and runs a, a company that does a whole bunch of things but one of them is an event around this company called cartoons underground and that link will be in the show notes as well. Um, she runs this with her partner, Patrick Smith, and their team of about four or five other people. And that's that team is optimized when the event is on. It's probably more like 20 people when the event is on. Okay. And it's around cartoons. But again, it's almost like Wonder Fruit here or Burning Man. It's just a big event where people that are interested in cartoons and manga, right? Japanese mm -hmm. manga are really big. Anything kind of cartoon related, which is not nearly as childish as it sounds. Um, come to this event and I think she said she had a thousand people there at the last one but they've been doing it for a few years and they have no intention of stopping okay this is a lady who's 26 now I believe she's been doing this for three or four years so you can see again non-stop right is it a comic con type thing or different you say it's like manga or in cartoon yeah it's so yeah I mean it's more just like it's more manga style but it's people that draw it's really trying to get people that are interested in the art around right right comics together right so it's not just the cartoons themselves it's people that produce art and if you look at what her founder patrick has been involved in it's all kind of art and alternative art related mm. it's really interesting i think he he runs a company called barfing media right so you can see that it's not standard issue fair but again this is stuff that's run by kids you know young 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 adults and Look, the one word that comes to mind, and we'll talk about classifications and word association when we talk about Nikki later and when we talk about Roshni as well, but the one word that I cannot get away from for all of these ladies is just energy. Mm. Right? Filled with energy. It's nonstop. And if one thing doesn't work, they'll try something else, but they just want to get stuff done. And to be fair, and I was thinking about this earlier, and I think it might be slightly controversial to say this, but... If these were men, the media, the sort of mainstream, more mainstream media would cover them much more heavily. 
mm. and they'd be way more famous. We'll get to Nikki in a second, but but what they've done already is pretty amazing. Anyway, I met Vicky because she was in Bangkok. She travels back and forth between Bangkok and her base in Singapore for business. Her main thing really is she's an expert in marketing, advertisement, advertising, excuse me, and public relations. Okay. She's 26 today. She founded her first company when she was 20 years old, a company called Chromaki. Yeah. I mean, when I was 20, there you go, <laughs> still like mucking around trying to figure out how to brush my hair, right? Um, but Chromaki was a company, it's a boutique fashion business that she was running in Singapore. I believe it's actually still active. I looked at its website. It's still there. And to be, as I was saying, to be fair, she's not even that far away from 20 now, 26, 27 years old, and she's still doing a bunch of really innovative and entrepreneurial things. And if you meet her in person, she's like highly engaging as well mm. and filled with energy. I was just impressed. Yeah. Really impressed. You said that you think that if she was a male founder, she probably would have got more coverage for what she was doing. Yeah, I mean, look, she's she's running a big event. So if you look at if you look at um, Wonder Fruit here, mm. right, the founders of that business are, are males and they kick butt to get that done. It's really hard. If you talk to event founders, right, you'll mm. see it's a very di- – you know this, right? You've done this. It's, it's a hustle, very different right? – yeah. it's complete hustle, okay? But, you know, this, this comic thing had a thousand people there. I'd never heard about it. Yeah. Like it was never covered in E27. I didn't see it covered in tech in Asia. And it's not that niche to be fair. Mm. It's just not. And I didn't know anything about it. But that's weird to me that I wouldn't know anything about it because it's taking place in Singapore. It's in a space that I do understand that I do follow. And I still had never heard about it. Well. Okay. And I think the press would cover it more. And that's the whole point really of just talking about this is getting out there and saying, I think people should know more about this and I want to spend some time giving exposure to women like Vicky because I think what she's doing is really incredible, actually. And you'll see for all of the women, both that we spoke about last week and that we'll speak about this week, is they're not just doing one thing either. Hmm. Right? And I'll talk about Roshni later, but the word that really defines her in my mind is focused. But when I say focused, it doesn't mean just doing one thing. It just means a laser focus on whatever they're doing at the moment and just a really strong commitment to kind of making it good and making it big, Mm. right? And these are not usually traits that people associate with, I would say incorrectly, with female founders. Why why is that, do you think? Because the founders that you're talking about today and the ones you talked about last week as well, compared to a lot of the male founders that I know, tend to be involved in a number of businesses. Why do you think that is? Why do I think it is what, that, that they don't get talked about or that the no, women no. are involved in multiple things? Yeah, I mean, a male founder, gen- I mean, it's a stereotype maybe, but generally they tend to have like one business and tend to be, you know, all in on that. But female founders, the successful ones seem to be involved in multiple businesses. Yeah, and, and I would say part of it is the sense that they're also helping other people incredibly, right? You look at a company like, just think about this, Grab, okay, Grab used to be Grab Taxi, hmm. does 10 million rides a month, maybe 11. Okay. Again, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but Tickled Media, through its um, parent websites, has 10 million mothers come to their website every month. Hmm. And yet the Grab founder is held up. First of all, he's running a billion dollar company. He's held up as an amazing guy. And he is amazing. I'm not taking anything away from him. But in comparison, like not too many people know about this parenting thing and business and media company that Roshni is running. And I don't know if that's because she's female or not, but I'm just saying that like she has the same number of people using her business that he has using his. Wow. And, and it's just, it's curious to me that there's not a, the same level of focus on it. Hmm. Right. And she runs a transactional business as well, the same way he does. I mean, I don't know what her LTV is right for each one of her clients. Um, but I know what it costs to, riding a taxi, and I know that the Grab businesses, whether it's Grab, Easy Taxi, um, Uber, Lyft, all of those businesses are heavily subsidized for growth. It makes sense. I'm not going to argue with that. But they're heavily subsidized, which means that their unit economics today are not great, but they will be better later. Right? I understand that they're taking money and investing in the business to grow that business. They think that it's winner take all in that space. I think there's room for a couple. Um, but if you look at the parenting stuff and the parenting, you know, media stuff that she does, you know, you'll see that like 
she has just as many people going to her site as they have users. I, I just think it's curious to me that it's not as famous as, um, as Grab. But I'll leave that to other people to decide whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's something we talked about last week as well, that the whole innovation thing. A lot of the male founders focus heavily on innovation. A lot of these female founders seem to focus more on usefulness, don't they? So don't they? Exactly. Which is what, you know, what I think is where some of the best businesses are, right? You know, you can be a very successful business without being the next Mark Zuckerberg, right? Without the next game changer, you can solve yeah. a problem that people have on an everyday basis, right? Like maybe some of these moms, right, in that community. Without having the next billion dollar app, maybe the men want to go out and get the next billion dollar app because there's a bit of pressure there or they think that's the kind of the big challenge thing, that the macho image of the founder. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. And again, look, this company like Grab or Gojek, which is an amazing, which is an amazing company, right? Um, you know, they are essentially copying businesses that were already existing in the United States, right? And that's okay too. We, you know, there's definitely room for that, right? But what she's doing, nobody else has done, hmm. at least in Asia, right? And she's not completely copying it because being a parent in Asia is way different than being a parent in Europe or in the United States. So even if the concept is similar. Like this, the Asian parent, whether it's in Indonesia, in India, where she's also um, existing, in Sri Lanka, in in Thailand, in the rest of Southeast Asia, like it's just very different because the cultural um, nuances around being a mother and being a parent are really different. But it's not so different. I mean, they'll argue on the Grab side and on the Lyft side and on the Uber side that sure, every country has a sort of unique nuances around getting into a car, but I don't think logistics is that different globally. It is different in some cases, but maybe the payment side of it is. And sure, these companies like Gojek and like um, Grab will get into payments and other services. Gojek is actually a more interesting company to me. We can talk about that in a future episode. I don't think we've done a lot on ride sharing. Um, but, but again, she's running a transactional business. Her unit economics must be much better. And yet the level of fame or the level of sort of glory that's associated with them, I just think is really different. If you look at the Asian parent business, it's actually out there helping people as well. Mm. It's hugely interactive, and she's built her own social network around it too. Um, we can talk more about that. I mean, maybe we should just talk about her since we're already on it a little yeah, bit, let's right? Yeah, do it. Um, I was going to end with her, but let's let's talk about this because it's interesting to me how I met her as well. Okay, this was almost four years ago. So back in 2013, it feels like 40 years ago, mm -hmm. right? And I met her because I was in Singapore on some other business. And I was meeting my friend, William Klipken, right? And he's a successful founder and an investor in his own right. We had actually spoken about him in one of our previous episodes because he's one of the principals in Cocoon Capital, okay? And he was just so impressed with this woman. And he made it, and when he made that super clear to me for me, he said, you're going to just, you're going to love this lady. She's so hardworking. She's smart as a whip. She's really sharp. You've got to meet her. And I said, okay, set it up. And I wanted to like, go tell her stuff and impress her with all the things that I was working on. And to be fair, I came away way more impressed with her than I was with me. <laughs> um, and as I said earlier, the one word that I could not get out of my mind when I met her was just focused. Like she had this look in her eye, like I'm listening to everything you're saying. I'm taking it in. I'm incredibly focused and I'm going to use everything that you're saying that's useful. And I'm just going to, you know, disobey, disobey anything you say <laughs> that I don't think is right. She was just amazing. And she had a vision back then, right, for the Asian parent. Because I was trying to sell her on this and do that and maybe have e-commerce involved. And she looked at me and she said, you know what? I tried that already. I think it's a little bit too early for that. I want to build this out socially first, build out the media side of it, and then maybe I'll go back and work on the e-commerce side. I remember it just clear as day. I remember exactly where we met. And it's funny because I periodically go on that street in Singapore and I remember the little coffee shop where we met. Um, and I was just ridiculously impressed, right? And it turns out that William, um, sorry, said that he knew her because he was an early investor in her parent company, which is called Tickled Media, which I also loved the name of that company, right? Mm -hmm. um, and remember, it started off small. She had been working on a, not a bunch, but a few other ventures, trying this and trying that. And this started off as a blog, just creating content for parents. And we said earlier, but this company now operates, I think it has almost 100 people in it. It operates in eight countries, and it has 10 million mothers. 10 million. Just think about it. Wow. Every ten, month. 10 million of a specific kind of customer as well. I mean, that's really value. 
Right. So if you think about and and I, I say that I, it's, it's not the right words to use, but if you think about like what that means, it's 10 million people who have a very specific thing going on in their life. They're either pregnant, trying to get pregnant, just had a baby or have a young child, whatever that sort of early parenting stages or pre-early parenting stages. So if you think about not just the service that that community provides to each other without any commerce right happening hmm. just the support system that's created by that that alone is incredible but the business opportunities that are associated with that too if you understand and i know you do but if people understand what an asian parent wants to do for their child or for their children um, whether it's learning or exposure to books and toys or just teaching them how to grow up and have like the right manners and all of those systems that are associated with that and the amount of money that most people spend or Asian parents spend on their children, this is a potentially very large business. And remember, she just started expanding into India about a year or so ago and that market itself is also huge. And with all the embedded knowledge and experience that she has building it in the sort of variable markets and very different markets in Southeast Asia, I think for her, and again, getting back to that laser focus for building it in India, that market is huge. Hmm. Really huge. Must be pretty hard to grow a business like that because when you sit on top of a large number of very focused customers, right, of a specific kind, you're going to get a lot of people knocking at the door. I mean, you can imagine all the advertisers wanting to advertise to these people, right? But on top of that, you have all the people that want to partner with you. So she must right. constantly be saying no because she must know exactly – this is the vision that I want for this. Therefore, this is not what it's going to be because, you know, every next company wants to partner with you or sponsor you and get this content on here and so on. That must be pretty tough. It's, I think it's got to be really hard. She, as you said, she must be approached every single day. And as we say in the United States, everybody and their brother is probably knocking on her door and calling her phone or sending her email saying, as you said, please partner with us. And, you know, saying no is way harder than saying yes. Right. But it's that focus that I talked about before where she'll look you in the eye and say, I have a vision. Don't get in the way of my vision. And I'm sure just like every other smart, motivated person, you know, one out of every 10 things that come to her, maybe it's 15. She'll go, that's it. I'm going to sort of integrate that into what I'm doing too. everybody else. You're just going to have to wait. Right. Um, now, one of the things you also said earlier was, you know, why is it that most women are involved in a bunch of different things? Right. And I, as as we talked earlier, I think for most people, running a company like that, 10 million users, is just enough. It keeps them busy, and they really can't focus on anything else. But like most female founders, she does more. Mm. Um, and one of the things she does more of is she gives back to her community, right? So in 2015, she founded something that I mentioned earlier, but now we'll name it the Female Founders Network. It includes over 2,000 members. Now, that must mean that a lot of these women are founders. Mm. Now, it's likely that some of them are men, but the men that are joining the Female Founders Network are likely there really to support the the women that are in um, that are in this group, right? And even Vicky, I should have mentioned this earlier about Vicky, but Vicky also participates in something called She Says. I believe this is a business or an organization that was started in Australia, but again, supporting women. Now, remember, most men in conjunction with running their business do not have to join an organization that supports male founders. It almost sounds stupid to say, doesn't right. it? Exactly. But those are being phased out, aren't they? You know, those kind of like boys clubs. They are because they kind of seem not so nice anymore. But women need to do this, unfortunately, because there is a whole bunch of um, headwinds in their way. And they they, they do this to sort of band together and help each other out. It's really nice, right? So she uses this as a as a platform for other people. She also helps other founders. She mentors them. She was originally a founder at JFDI, right, which is um, <laughs> Joyful Frog <laughs> Digital Incubator. <laughs> if you really knew what JFDI stood for, you'd be laughing along with me. <laughs> um, I'm sure you've heard the story, but just think about what JFDI could stand for. Trying to register it as a business when the Singapore sort of business registry asks you, it was just thinking, do it. Yeah. Think about what the F could stand for. Anyway, yeah. I always thought it was funny, but she was a mentor there. Um, I know Hugh Mason and Charlie and um, those guys were running and gals were running a really great business, but because she was in Singapore, she was also working with them. 
But I think one of the most interesting things that she's done as well, I remember giving back, right, is she was also an executive producer of a 2014 documentary. Hmm. Right? And if you think about it, Untouchable Children of God, and this is a movie about young women in the brothels of India, and, you know, simply says just how they're sold and trafficked from Nepal and the rest of, rest of Asia. Hmm. Sad right? story. Again, yeah, it's a really sad story. But again, if you're if you're a very successful woman, you want to go out there and pay attention to these issues. Men should be paying attention to this as well. Um, and you know, good for her and the rest of the people that were involved in this documentary. But it also won a humanitarian award at the Newport Beach Film Festival in 2014. And I put a um, I put a link to the IMD page there in the show notes as well. Um, but this is the type of lady, remember we talked about how, last week we talked about how Shannon was involved in not just being the CMO and the founder and the sort of visionary behind Moxie, which turned into Orami, but all the other sort of giving back things that she does, you know, rushing in the same way, you know, you pick your cause and you just go after it all the time. It's very impressive to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a great role model as well. I think that's the key, isn't it? I mean, that's these networks that they're involved with, the sort of the, the founders coming through, the entrepreneurs who look up to people like Rosny, you know, they provide great role models. And we talked about this last week, how few and far between those really are, or there may be a lot of them out there, but they just don't get the media coverage that somebody of the same caliber, but, you know, born a male would get, right? Unfortunately, yeah. that's how it is, isn't it? You know, that, just is what it is. Yeah, I I agree. Exactly, and we we're very lucky. I mean, as men, again, we talked about it last week. We got born checking all the right boxes. You know, we we can choose <laughs> thousands, hundreds of thousands of potential role models. You know, one for you know every fancy that you may have, but for women, it's it's a lot harder, isn't it? You yeah, know? and and the other thing I was thinking about today, right, is that you know, for a, when a man gets put into sort of the entrepreneurial category. Um, it, it comes with certain traits, and any of those traits are okay, right? So if I want a role model that's really aggressive, I'll, you know, go with Travis Kalanick. Right. Right? Just pit bull going forward. No one's going to get in my way. I need to fight this, even if I'm a nice guy, right? And we don't know him personally. We can't yeah. comment on that, okay? He could be the nicest guy in the world, but put in a situation where he's running into regulatory headwinds and all these other things, but it's okay for him as a guy to be a pit bull. Yeah. There, there's like very little negative connotation around that personality. Um, I wonder what it would be like if he was For a woman. Her. But as a man, I can use him as a role model if I'd like. Right. I can use, I can use Elon Musk as a role model, run multiple com- companies. I'm an intellectual. I'm a foreigner. You know, I come into a country where I'm not a native. And I'm just a deep intellectual, right? And I run multiple companies. I can be the Twitter founders, right? Right. Or I could the be... Burdens. Yeah, whoever. Yeah. Be, I could be Bezos. I could. He could be my. He could be my. Um. You know, my mentor or the person that I look up to. I have so many choices. Right. Right. That's amazing, right. isn't it? I mean, whatever your personality fit is, you can find somebody who's probably more like you than somebody you know in your own sort of personal network. But for women, I mean, can you think of a female Travis Kalanick? You know. Maybe you've met one in your life, but not one who's successful in business, right? I mean, I certainly haven't, somebody of that caliber. But even if I could, even if I could, right, unfortunately, the negative connotation right. of a woman who's that aggressive is just, it's just tragically unfair. Right, right. And I hate to use those words about fairness and unfairness, because in a way, excuse my language, but that's a little bit of a bullshit classification. I and mean, I'm sorry to, to use, you know, negative language, but the point is that there's a real negative connotation associated with that if you're a female, which is just wrong. It's just right. all wrong. You should be allowed to do anything. And, um, you know, you listen to someone like Kara Swisher talk or Hillary Clinton talk, and you listen to them and you think, they'll tell you, I tried that. I tried right. to be emotional. I tried to make the connect. I tried to, and every time I tried to do something out of what the normal accepted, accepted behavior is for a woman, I got burned for it. Right. Right, because media itself is also dominated by men, and most of those men, when it, you know, and just humans, right? When humans feel like something's going to get taken away from them, that their dominance is going to get taken away, they fight back. Yeah, 
right? As opposed to kind of be, be inclusive and let people join in that little party. So it's very hard for women to find the right role models. And hopefully over time, women like Roshni, like Nikki, like Shannon, like the Nikki we talked about last week, like Vicky, will change that so that the next generation of ladies can come up and say, I want to be like Roshni Matani. I want to be like Nikki Sabaton. I want to be like Nikki Surapaitun, right? I want to be like Shannon Kalyanamit. Like, it's really important for them to have that there. And it's really important for these women not to give up, hmm. not to shy away, actually, from making that, those points, I think. It's important for us as well, because you know, I think for males in business to see these role models and think, well, that's fine. You know, there are people like that. So, you know, the first time you ever see somebody, let's say you see the female Travis Kalanick, the first time you meet that person, it's going to be a little bit strange, right? And it's going to be certainly strange for people who don't get it. But, you know, when, once it's out there and people accept it, then it's a lot easier, isn't it, for the next person to come through and say, well, you know, you've got in your head, we talked about stories last week, you've got in your head that story of that person who behaves like that. You've seen it before, it's nothing new. Absolutely. So for, for this whole generation of people coming through now, well, it's nothing new, it's, it's always been like that, right? So these people get accepted so much more readily, right? That's, right. It's right. a lot harder for the first one to be Absolutely. the first woman Travis Kalanick, or even the first woman entrepreneur in a certain field, right? Sure. Sure. I mean, look, it would have been unthinkable a generation ago for someone like Tim Cook to run Apple. Right, exactly. And to be who he is. And the same thing for someone like Peter Thiel. And the same thing for someone like Nick Denton. Like, all of these people could not have run their companies a generation ago, but they were pioneers that made that okay. And it should be okay. And now it is okay, and that's the way it should be for women as well. They should be able to just have their own personality that fits into any category, and that should all be okay. And for my daughter, who's 15, turning 16 this year, she should be able to look at them and say, hey, that's okay. Right. If that's what I want my role model to be, that's what I'm going to choose, and I'm going to follow those footsteps, and that should be fun. But isn't it interesting, you mentioned Tim Cook, and we talked about this last week, you're talking about female entrepreneurs. And yep. you know, the day will come when we stop talking about female entrepreneurs. But then you talk about people like Peter Thiel and, and uh, Tim, Tim Cook. Cook. You know, as you know, nobody says these are sort of gay CEOs, do they? I mean, nobody. No, says, so, I mean, we don't hear yeah. that. I mean, it's mentioned, but then it's like, okay, well, so what? What, what difference does it make? Right? Nobody Who, cares, and nobody should care. <laughs> but then it's still female entrepreneurs, right? You know. Yeah. <laughs> So there's a lot bigger, you know, obviously that's not an issue, but they should, you know, it should be treated in the same way that really at the end of the day, why does it matter? It doesn't. It doesn't. And, you know, I talk about this a lot offline, right? I think one of the great things, and you'll see how this gets into the same category in a second, but, you know, my daughter goes to international school and it turns out that the international schools in Thailand are actually very, very diverse. I don't know if I've mentioned this, um, on the air before, but they're very diverse. And what that means is that her exposure and her friend's exposure to people of different cultures and different backgrounds and different colors, races and religions, is just automatic. Yeah. And I've had a bunch of her friends, male and female, you know, tall, short, fat, skinny, all of them over to the house. And it's literally like the United Nations. Yeah. I love that. It's awesome. And they never, even when they explain to me who the other person is, it's never, I, I think I've mentioned this to you before, right? It's never the defining factor. Right. You know, please go pick up Billy at the station. How will I know Billy? Right? It turns out he's got a very definitive thing, but it's like he's the guy in the baseball cap. Right. He's not the Chinese guy or the no, Thai guy not, or whatever. <laughs> no, it's none of that. It's not like, oh, he's the guy from Bolivia. It's like he's the guy with the right. Boston Red Sox cap on. Right. Isn't that such an important mindset to take through to the, the next generation of work, right? Because those are the people we're going to need, isn't it? completely who don't see those barriers i know it may be you know people may think oh that's great you're thinking in terms of the fluffy stuff of business but you know we need people who can operate between markets and not see barriers and it's the same with the women right you know a lot of these women <laughs> have that kind of multicultural upbringing inbred into them from an early day early age right you know a lot of these the, the examples you talked about this week and last week these are people who you know lived across multiple countries and different backgrounds, right? So, I mean, how important that is to cut through the, the BS, right? Right. I mean, let's talk, let's spend a little bit of time talking about Nikki. I've mentioned her name already. So, a different Nikki from last week, right? Nikki Asavaton. And she, as you said, was, um, you know, raised in Thailand, obviously, but educated 
at the university level in England. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, multicultural, multilingual, and she fits into that category. Right. She's not defining people by where they're from and what they look like. She's really defining people by like, are you useful? Right. And we talked about this earlier, too. I think every great entrepreneur, every great person has their own defining qualities. Right. And Nikki, like Roshni, has many of those things. But if I had to pick just a few of them. I would say adaptability or flexibility, and I think that comes from that sort of international exposure of just seeing different ways of doing things and understanding how to adapt and be flexible with them. She's also deeply insightful, which means she's very thoughtful, right? She'll hear new things and she'll think, how does that fit in? How can I use this? Where does that work? Have I heard this before? And she's also ridiculously determined. Again, if you sit down and talk to her, you meet her for the first time, she has that look on her face, again, like no one's going to get in my way. <laughs> okay, and I met her before I met Roshni, so I met her in 2012, and I really thought the first time I met her was, wow, this woman is really determined, mm. right? And here's the thing, the tech ecosystem in Thailand and even in Southeast Asia back in 2012 was not nearly as mature, and it's not super mature yet, but it was really just at the beginning. Okay, and she was already running one of the most successful offline dating companies in Southeast Asia. So she wasn't online yet, but she was starting to attend some of these conferences because she could see the change coming. This is where the insightful part comes, right? But this company that she was running was high end only, right? It was offline dating, very successful businessmen wanting to meet very successful businesswomen who didn't have time, right? So not only was it a business to help sophisticated men and women to meet, date, and, and marry, right? But it was also a very successful business itself, mm -hmm. which was great, right? So in 2015, that business was acquired. This is a great thing, right? By a Singapore company called Lunch, actually, and integrated into their sort of online dating platform. She still maintains her directorship there, so she's still involved in that business to a certain extent. But here's an example of a woman running a real company with real revenues, making a real profit, sold and integrated to an, an online company that's also real. And I think this qualifies as like a real and very early exit to me. <laughs> right? And I wonder as well, how come this doesn't, maybe it wasn't for $100 million, maybe it wasn't for 50. In a way, I kind of don't care. But this is the perfect offline to online, integrated, real exit, real money changes hands. She's still directing one of them. She's a pioneer here, right? Yeah. Have you ever heard of this stuff? Maybe it's too real, as you say. Is that the problem that the media have with something like this compared to an Uber? Or, you know, this is like, this is real money, profit here and now, making <laughs> money, you know, compared to something that maybe, you know, you know the story. Yeah, I mean, it, it's much easier to talk about like a unicorn or something with a fancy nickname, right? But it's, it's, it should be better to talk about people that run real businesses, wake up every day, right. do really great things, and then pioneer this stuff out. I Did didn't mention as well, and this is one of the reasons, you know, I'm deeply interested in media, otherwise we wouldn't even be talking to each other. But um, she also did a television show. Yeah. I don't know whether it was weekly or monthly, but, you know, Nikki was on TV frequently on her own show, but also being interviewed about meat and lunch, and she was running a, a dating-focused show, right? And when some of the local dating apps like Noon Swoon were starting to be generated back in 2012 and 2013, they would come to her, right, to mentor her quietly and privately, which she did do. Again, another woman who had plenty of time to help other people out. And I'll, I'll say this. When she first came to me, introduced herself, we first started talking back in 2013, you know, I, again, I was more impressed with her than I was with me. And I learned a lot just going through some of her early business plans and just talking to her about a whole bunch of stuff around business, right? And she, like I said, she saw the move to online really early, back in 2012 and 2013. And since the dating business itself was, I wouldn't say heavily gamified, but there is kind of a gamification aspect to that yeah. type of business, right? So she saw that. It interested her a lot. She spent a lot of time and energy Again, while she's running that business, thinking and learning about that sector, where can I use the gamification experience that I have and how can I turn that into a business? And she started a mobile game company in 2014. Mm. 
again, the only other game companies that I knew of in Southeast Asia were all started by men. So she walked into a completely male domain, went to some people, you know, to be mentored in that space, and then kind of spun it out on her own. So she started this game called Infinity Levels in 2014. It's in the press, right? Nice and quietly. She raised a half a million dollars, 500 grand for that company. And she's won multiple awards, okay? I think in 2016, she won an Indie Game Award. She won multiple awards for in the United States, by the way, mm. um, for the games that her company has produced. So, you know, what she's done is nothing short of amazing as well. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, yeah. just going back a little bit, do you think one of the reasons why these female entrepreneurs are so successful at what you call like the real businesses is that because the the sort of the avenues available to maybe the male counterparts uh, are less of av- less available in the sense that you know doing the incubator accelerator thing doing the mba or the the you know stanford graduation straight into a you know a y combinator type thing do they have to go and hustle and do the real company because they probably get less people available to back them early on but now obviously now it's different now she has the pedigree right and proved herself do you think that's why they turn to the real businesses because they don't have the ability to raise capital like men yeah and i also think it's necessary for them to kind of generate real revenue and even potentially i don't know if if I say this, maybe I'll get struck by lightning, but like profits, real profits, <laughs> you know, not the kind of fake profits that we had spoken about in previous episodes where it's yeah. like, it's profit if you exclude all costs kind of thing. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So it's, I am profitable if you remove all costs. Right. It's real money that you can take out of the company profit. Right? Yeah. It's like stuff you can buy dinner with <laughs> is what I like to say. Like if you can't buy a meal with it, it's not really profit, which – I guess we should talk about Bitcoin then because somebody was somebody was asking me last week, like, can I buy a donut with that? <laughs> exactly. Anyway, but I digress. Um, but yeah, I do think there's a part of that, right? Mm. And I think, look, we talked about this too last week. Men and women are different. But, but it doesn't mean that the opportunities open to them should be different. Yeah. They can approach them from different perspectives. They can use them in different ways. They can attack them in different ways, but the opportunity should be the same. And I think that's really the key, right? Mm-hmm. The the availability of funding, the availability of mentorship, and just the availability of anything should be the same. Now, the way they attack that is going to be completely different. And I think to a certain extent, women are more realistic than men. You know, men are like big dreamers and women are just like, look, right. let's just get stuff done. And that's good. I think both of those things are good. And there, there's a use for both of them. Um, but part of the reason I think why that's probably true is what you said is that they don't have the um, the luxury of saying, I'll get the profitability in three years because they're taken much less seriously, unfortunately. Yeah. They have I've to had prove themselves, right? women to do this, yeah. They Which is good, right? Because, I mean, it, it sort of, you know, it toughens them up a little bit more, you know. Maybe men have it a lot easier, easier if people are throwing money at them, right? You know, if people are going to invest $50,000 in their idea, if you're just having some random idea and, you know, a woman would never get that. So she has to go out and hustle and get some revenues and profit, dare say. So in a way, you know, it sort of teaches them real business. And maybe that's why, you know, they seem to be involved in multiple businesses. They have transferable skills, right? Yeah, exactly. Right? They, they understand business, the real business. And business is, you know, at the root of all business is hustle, isn't it? Yeah, it's all it's very similar, right? So if you're good at, if you're good at running one business, you're good at running a business, right? You know this yeah. from running your own. Like the theories and the, the procedures around the business are not that different. It's maybe the vertical is different, but the process of actually building it and making it profitable and choosing the right people and getting your human resources right and getting your expenses in order are pretty much the same. Yeah, I think. for sure. Yeah. Um, anyway, I think we could go on and on talking about, you know, not just Nikki, not just Roshni and, you know, Shannon and Nikki we talked about last week and also Vicky. And all the stuff that at Akin Asia that we talked about too, and Blair running her hair in Asia business, all that kind of stuff. I think we could go on and on talking about this. Um, but I, I think we've kind of made the point. And the point is that there's a ton of women out there that are really impressive in their businesses. And the more exposure we can give to them, the barrier, the bigger the barriers are that we can help them break down. And what it means is that for the next generation of women, what they do will just be considered normal standard operating procedures and as you said earlier 
in the same way we don't talk anymore in the United States about being a black quarterback or being, you know, a gay CEO, we won't talk in Southeast Asia about being a female founder. It won't matter. Right. Is that good for us as guys? I mean, I'm purely thinking on selfish terms here. You, you said earlier that we feel threatened when we lose control. Why do we want to promote female entrepreneurs? What's the benefit to us? I'll tell you what the benefit to us is. The world is a better place when everybody has more <laughs> opportunity. It just is. And here's the thing. So, like, I, I say this a lot. A real man supports women because he's not afraid. Yeah. And a real, like a person with true self-confidence, not just filled with bluster, wants everybody to have the same chance because then when you win, you've really won. Right? In other words, I, you know, I played plenty of sport when I was a kid, right? If we cheated and had 12 people on a side because I played soccer, football, whatever you want to call it, if the other team only had 10 or 9 and you won, I wasn't happy. Hmm. Like just the score itself doesn't matter. It's how you win that matters. But, but society benefits as well, right? Because if opportunities are available to everybody, that means everybody gets to improve and get better. And then it removes, t it removes unnecessary tension, like the benefits to the world and to society. If everybody has a close enough, approximate equal opportunity, then it's great for everybody, mm -hmm. right? But also, I wanna be very clear about this. A real man is not afraid of women having opportunity. They're not because they're not afraid of competing on an even playing field. Yeah. A fake man is some guy filled with bluster, right, who's maybe taking steroids to make his muscles look big. We'll do the same <laughs> thing for other parts of his business. No, you know the way this works. You train. You know this. Yeah. You finished Iron Man, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I didn't take any steroids. But you didn't though, right? Yeah, exactly. It was the competition and the process that really makes you proud, right? What is it, 140-something? I don't even know, but it's amazing what you do. You're right? not competing against the other people as well. I mean, you don't. if somebody competes and finishes, crosses the line, you don't. that doesn't take away from you, right? It's the no. same with like, I mean, it's the whole thing is that everybody's on this race, this journey together. And if you, there's a female entrepreneur on that journey with you as well, her being successful doesn't take away from your success, right? I mean, it's that sort of abundant mindset, isn't it? I guess some people have a win-lose mindset, right? You know, if you yeah. win, I lose, right? It's that sort of scarcity mindset, right? And I guess those people may be threatened by anybody's success, particularly women, right? Yeah, I mean, look, James Alt Altucher, Altucher always says, oh, yeah. right? He says, I've got 100 ideas a day. I share them all freely. If you can out execute me, go for it. Yeah. Just go for it. I dare you. But you know what I mean? I can't act, I can't act on 100 of my ideas. So maybe 99 of those will go to other people, men and women, gay and straight. I don't care. Right. And I don't think anybody should really care. The benefits to society are huge and unending. And for the people that don't see that, I mean, I don't know, Devils. screw them, right? Yeah, exactly. You know what? Some of these uh, corporate events that I go to in Japan, I wonder, you know, think about the question that I ask myself is that how would we benefit? And I'm thinking as a, you know, whether I'm a guy or a woman, it doesn't really matter, but going to these corporate events and they're, they're quite stuffy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I would think sometimes wouldn't it be great if there was actually a woman at this event, because I'm looking around at these networking events, these konchinkai, where you've got all these, you know, you've got a hundred guys in suits all sort of exchanging <laughs> business cards and talking right. about startups. Yep. Right? And that you can't see a woman or there is a woman and she's sort of, you know, she's the one holding the tray with the drinks on it, right? Yep, it's and terrible. I'm, that's how it is right, in Japan. And I'm thinking, wow, if there was women here, that would kind of shake it up. And I'm thinking purely from the perspective of the boys club. You know, I hate those boys club sort of mindsets and atmospheres, you know, and they exist everywhere in business. You know, if they can break that up, you know, if you put women into the fray, then that sort of like all us boys together changes, you know. I don't think it does us any good having that kind of culture, right? You no. Know, it's stifling. You get kind of introspective views of the world and, you know, behaviors and stuff like that. You put a woman in there, it changes everything. It so does. more of that. Look, the more diversity, the better off we all are, right? And I had actually said more than 20 years ago that the biggest underutilized resource in Asia was its females. Wow. And I, and I believe that very strongly. That's why, I t that's why I have this discussion. And I did a lot of things, you know, quietly um, in the past to make sure that that resource was not as underutilized as it might have been otherwise. And, you know, as with everything else, your impact is small, but as long as you start that ripple going, mm. that impact can get bigger over time. And that's kind of one, that's one of the things that I'm trying to do. 
Fantastic. Are we going to talk about surprise today? Yeah, so I've kind of been holding off over the past few weeks. Maybe we've been talking about things that are Building a little too up. serious. <laughs> but, You're doubling you know, down on this week. Say that again? You're doubling down on the surprise this week. I'm doubling down. This is a good one. Sorry. So um, yeah, it was announced um, this week in, in the tech press in Southeast Asia that a company called Proper Hands is going to shut down. Mm. So, again, this is not a big surprise, but let's go over this, right? It was reported in E27, so let's give them props for reporting on this. Um, but let's talk about it a little bit. What does Proper Hands do? Well, Proper Hands was basically focused on sort of streamlining and making it easier for people to book, pay, and sort of generate revenue for domestic help, mm. right? I mean, if you go and look at the website for properhands.com, which I think we should do, <laughs> okay? Let's just go look at it. Proper hands, Singapore. You can hear me typing, mm -hmm. okay? This website won't be up much longer. <laughs> Beautifully designed. It's a, night, it's a nice white picture on the cover. It's really beautiful. It's airy and bright. I don't think anybody actually lives like this in Singapore, by the way. Um, and everything's free, no agency wow. fees. That's not a time. Singapore apartment, is it? I'm sorry. And no insult in Singapore is a wonderful place. I, you know, some of my best friends are, live there kind of thing. But it, there are no illegal cleaners, easy online scheduling. What are our services? Um, it's all focused on your hall, your bedrooms, and your common areas will be clean. We'll clean your kitchen. We'll yeah. clean your bathroom. But additional services, ironing, window cleaning. We'll clean the inside of your oven. I'm being a little sarcastic. I hope it's not really that bad. Um, we'll clean your refrigerator and you know, when it's, the prices aren't that bad, urgent one time cleaning. If you need this urgent within the next two to five days, $25 an hour, mm. an hour. Okay. Advanced recurring cleaning is $20 an hour. You can hire a maid. Okay. Again, not according to me, but according to the, according to the press. Okay. Look at the article in the Straits Times, which we'll put in the show notes, but there's an entire industry around maids from the rest of Asia coming into Singapore, and the minimum salary was raised to $570 a month. Okay, so think about what $25 or $20 an hour is, and then what $507 a month for full time work. I've been in Singapore to some of you know people that I know, their homes or their apartments, it's full time. It's please help my kids get ready for school at 7 o'clock in the morning and please clean up after the dinner table at 7 o'clock at night. And at five days a week and $507 a month, it's ridiculously cheap. And in a city where the GDP per capita is over $52,000 a year, right, the market for like maid services and clean your home at the last minute must online must be de minimis. Yeah. It just has to be, right? And the... The interesting part about this for me as well is that <laughs> I originally was going to say they took money because I think that's probably a better word, but they raised the seed investment of 250000 Singapore dollars back in 2015. And you now look, this has always been a really competitive space with very low margins. It wasn't even like they were introducing the service into a market that had no other services, right? I wonder what the pitch was back then, right? Because Offline services for essentially for maids, which we know are very prominent in Asia and Southeast Asia as well. I had a maid when I was in Japan. I have you know domestic help here as well. But online in Singapore, in Singapore alone, there was a there was another business funded by Rocket Internet. And actually, when I was doing research on this, I thought Rocket Internet. Are they still around? Like are they right. still doing stuff? And so we talked about it a little bit. They come up in this bit. section a lot. Yeah, but I can't help laughing because, remember, again, those were the guys carrying the Uzis and the big automatic weapons, and now they're like, are those guys around kind of thing? Anyway, but they were running a business called helping.com.sg, and if you go look at that website as well, it's almost like they had the same person design it. Lots of white space, mm. you know, a very light-skinned person, which, you know, again, we're in Asia, right? So we like the fact that, you know, there's different um, – ethnicities out here that's a good thing not a bad thing but again very clean environment book your cleaners from $20 per hour so it can't be that different right yeah so that's another business doing it 
And then there's more. There was also something called Fuss.sg. They're basically all offering the same right. service. It can't be. I mean, it, the size of that market must be tiny in Singapore, right? I mean, for three companies like this, and the margins must companies. be, well. Right? But three companies, and, and I, you know, I like to say, like, in really technical terms, like in a geography where this is completely unnecessary, right? I mean, we can do a little bit of math, and then we can kind of finish up on this. But, like, Singapore has 5.5 million people in it as of a 2015 census. It's not that far away. Right. Okay. Population in Singapore is actually very heavily controlled. So immigration is controlled by the government. There's not a lot of space there, so people are not having three or four kids. They're generally having one and a half kids, right? On average, if you think about families, if a family is three people, let's just say on average, right? Right. You divide that 5.35 million people by three, you get 1.78 million families. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not a ton of families. Just simple back of the sort of napkin calculation. If half of those families can afford a maid or don't already have one, right? Mm -hmm. Because not everyone can afford sort of domestic help. Now you're down to 890,000 families. And let's say that 5% of those families use this service. Because right, you've got to get traction and you've got to market it and all this other stuff. But let's say they do that at $20 a shot. It's the lowest possible price. And they use it 50 weeks a year because, you know, everybody goes on vacation. They go away. Let's just say, like I said, back of the napkin, it's a total GMV, right? Total revenue into the business. But most of that revenue is going to have to pay the helpers, right? It's like $89 million. Right. That's the complete market value, not not how much this company can make. That's if they could get 100% of that market, right? Yeah, but what are they taking? In other words, where a normal maid can earn $570 a month, which is, what, 6000 a little bit more, $10,000 a year, right? What, like, what is what is that going to do? Even if they take a 10% commission mm. off of that $89 million bucks, it's only $8.9 million of revenue. Gross. Gross. Mm. Okay, in other words, if you even think of like a 35% profit margin, which is probably high, right, you get a bit more than $3 million of profit. Right. Yeah, I could go on and on on the calculations here, but it's not really a big, and remember, that's only for one company. There were at least three companies in there doing this, probably a few more we don't know about. Plus, remember, sorry, I feel like I'm interrupting you. No, no, no. I was just thinking, but, yeah. I mean, there are also a ton of offline companies. Exactly. Words, That's what I was going to say. It must be all the incumbents that have been doing it for years, right? For years, where the people are bonded and trusted. And this did not seem to be a problem, even in like, you know, co on the cocktail circuit. I don't remember anyone saying, oh boy, if someone could just put this business online and automate it for me, I'd be happy to pay way more than I'm paying right. now for this. This kind of reminds me like we did a, lot, a few weeks back, we did food delivery in Hong Kong as an example, right? You know, that's yep. Yep. another example, which is, you know, not only is it a hugely saturated market for eating options, but it's not that big, is it? No. No. And remember, the Hong Kong thing was also heavily segmented as well, right? It's like right. Niche. this kind of food, really healthy food, yeah, the yeah. Paleolithic food. I'm, I'm exact, Again, I'm making it up, right? But you're right. The paleo dialect, not paleolithic, but the business model seems a little paleolithic to me. Yeah. Um, for those of you scoring at home, but again, you just have to do the simple math on this, and it's just not going to work. Mm. So when this business shuts down, and I feel bad, right? Because you know they had their own people doing tech work and all this other stuff, right? I never think this is. I never think this is a good thing. But I like to look at things from an investment perspective, and I wonder based on even just four years ago, when was this company started again? 2013, 2014, right? Yeah, it's 2014, it's only three years ago. And the investment that they took was in 2015. So if you're looking at opportunity costs for capital investment, this is the way I approach this, right? It's not a joke to me. There's a bunch of different things in which you can invest and there are opportunity costs to it. Is this an investable yeah. business? Not really. Exactly. Not really, because the online component doesn't add anything to it, right? So think about a business like Eat2Go. You can make a case as to whether this thing scales or not, but it's getting a lot of traction. But the on, but the online part, the tech part, actually makes a big difference. You walking past a restaurant, you click the button that says, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, is there anything around me? It knows where you are. It optimizes for time, right, because a restaurant at 3 o'clock doesn't have a lot of clients, and you're hungry if you're a tourist or if you're just walking around the neighborhood and you haven't had lunch, you go, 
what's open now? Where can I get a deal? You press the button and it says, around the corner, there's a Chinese restaurant, 50% off the normal prices because there's no one there now. The tech really matters using location-based stuff, the GPS, all this stuff, plus you're optimizing. Again, it's like going to the GDSs for the airlines. Right. You're optimizing your load balancing. That's a great idea. Whereas this, right. it's almost like it's just brochureware, isn't it? I mean, the, the website's just a that's brochure. It. That's it. It's right. not adding any value. And remember, we talked about the fact that, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I, I know. I want to talk about me because you're well smarter than I am. But there's a whole bunch of stuff that I know, but a whole bunch of stuff that I don't know. But if I learn something new, I try to apply it to everything else, right? And we talked about before how some, in some cases, the food delivery business could actually just be a data gathering business. Yeah. Right? Because everybody eats but in this case, so I try to think now, is this just a data gathering business? But I don't think so. Because right. I don't think you learn enough. Right. Because they're not collecting any data and the maid's not collecting any data at the front line either, is she? No, because they don't know what your preferences are. They don't know what you're purchasing. They don't know anything about you except you're having a party on Thursday night and you need a maid. Right. But again, this gets back to a topic we discussed probably 15 episodes ago. I can't remember. And that is... In a market where home and domestic help is already inexpensive and readily available, yeah. what does the tech add to this business? And if I'd come to you with an offline business and said, I want to streamline the offline business, would you invest $250,000 in this? You would have laughed me out of the office <laughs> because it wouldn't make any sense. But you can see why they probably – come with that because they look at the math up front without sort of working out the market value you know if you pay a, a filipina maid what 570 singapore dollars so about 400 us dollars a month yep. they probably look at that and think wow you know the, the raw material in this business is really cheap yes and we can charge these middle class families 20 dollars an hour we can we can make a killing Right. So, I mean, that, just on that conversation alone, it sounds like a great idea. But then, you know, the rest, the math that you've walked through, it isn't right. But right, let's do. Yeah. Sorry. Let's do one more quick calculation. Right. We, we often say there are 630 million people living in Southeast Asia. We've already did it. We've already defined a family of as at least three people. We cut that and that's 210 million families. Let's cut it in half to say the number of families that can actually afford it. It's 105 million families. Right. If 105 million families use this service twice a week, it's 210 million transactions at $20 a week. It's $4.2 billion a year. It sounds huge. Right. But the fact is that that money is already getting paid. If those people are all using domestic help twice a week, that money is already getting paid. But the reality is that it's much cheaper for people to do it on a monthly basis for their existing maid, which they've got a reference from their uncle who yeah. has, a, has home domestic help who has a cousin who wants a job, you're happy to employ them, you're very good to them, you give them a bonus at the end of the year. And think about it, at that $4.2 billion, right? I used half the families, but the reality is that if only 5% of them do it, now you're down to $210 million and you haven't had any costs yet and you haven't paid any of your maids yet. That's just revenue to you. If 90% of that is paid to the domestic helpers themselves and you only take 10%, now you're running a regional business that's based on 630 million people and you're generating revenue for your business of $21 million. Yeah, and that's just you, right? Yeah, that's, that's not the competition. Exactly. And remember, like, like, tell me, what's the barrier to entry, right? We talk about right. moats around businesses, right? What's the barrier to entry for entering that business? Right. Nothing. Right, you, you, a Filipino maid could walk in and do your job, compete against your business, right? Right, and remember, for me... This type of kind of temp agency style business, I think I might have told you this story, but I learned this when I was on a summer job for college. And you can tell I was ridiculously rich when I was a kid. That's sarcastic, by the way. <laughs> um, because I was working for a job at a Cadillac dealership and I was making $4.25 an hour. Okay, And my job was to actually help out the CFO of this business. He was just literally the accountant, but there was no other accounting guy there. So he was it. And I remember thinking one day, wait a second. Wait a second. The temp agency is making twelve fifty an hour, and they're paying me four twenty five. <laughs> the I, have an idea. I have an idea. I quit. So I actually <laughs> went into the CFO's office, and I said, can we just chat for a second? 
Yeah. I realize you're paying those guys twelve fifty. I'm only here for the summer, yeah? Why don't we do this? I'll quit. You pay me six fifty an hour. You save half of your thing. I make more money. Everybody's happy. I'll work twice as hard. I don't care. And he was like, hmm. And I said to him, I looked at him. I said, I quit. And he goes, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> and there, but, there was your most important and valuable business lesson of your whole <laughs> career, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, but what it taught me was that the stickiness of that business. In other words, when a temp agency puts somebody in a in a job, yeah. and the person's outperforming. In other words, normally a temp agency is there because everybody's crap, yeah. and they just put someone in the business to fill a slot, and three weeks later that person leaves, and it's all bad. And they just they can't go through the process of hiring because it's just too expensive. But when they find somebody really good, and I was really good, they said, "Whoa, okay, we'll take you for the eight weeks or six weeks that you're here. We got it. We'll pay you more." We don't need that thing. That level of stickiness is the same thing in the maid business. Right? Because once you find domestic help that you like, you fire them. Yeah. And then you hire them back at a higher salary for them, but you're not paying out any of the exorbitant costs to the service that's doing it, if there are costs to it. And that means that the stickiness for people running a business like Fuss or Helping or Proper Hands is not there. Yeah. Anyway, it's not a big surprise to me that that thing goes out of business. Hopefully all the people that are working on that business, you know, find another job. You heard it here. Great. Good episode this week, Michael. Thank you, Graham. Um, so you can find me on Twitter at Michael Waits. Please hashtag Asia tech podcast.com Asia tech podcast. Um, Graham and I do this every week. You can subscribe to us on iTunes. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. Did I miss anything, Graham? Well, asiatechpodcast.com website, if you want to go and check out all our episodes and our blog posts. Yeah, hey, I heard you were blogging. It's great. Yeah. I like the fact, I really do. And you and I, I like the fact that we do this together too, and I'll tell you why. Because things that interest you are not on the top of my mind necessarily, and things that interest me, we find different stuff. We're heavily curated, which is great. Only the stuff that real people want to read. You saw what I posted, right? Yeah. Search less, read more learn more i think it's really important actually and i think it's really it's been a great addition to what we've already been doing so watch the blog as well you've been listening to asia tech podcast find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com